I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon at Aintree and uh, a university academic. Um, I um, chair the research side of the Head and Neck Centre, which is a growing collection of uh, principal investigators that uh, are involved in research. So the, the idea of um, this lecture um, really came about after a discussion amongst our research group that with, uh, with the pandemic, we were um, working hard, but we were working in our own silos and we weren't meeting on a regular basis. And we felt actually with the, the, the broader aims of the centre, um, we might have an opportunity to bring clinicians, researchers, uh, the educational, the whole side of the Head and Neck Centre together around uh, maybe a monthly lecture. As you know, the Head and Neck Centre is a collaboration of the, um, the NHS units um, in the Liverpool Trust in Clatterbridge, the Dental School, Walton, um, with the HEIs, particularly the University of Liverpool, um, and patients as well. Uh, I think we can probably stretch to do uh, continuing professional development points. If people attend, we can give them a certificate so they can put that in their appraisal folder. But with regard to trying to make the research accessible and to get this balance, I was thinking it, it's really a bit like um, uh, a smaller version of a TED talk is what we're aiming at. Um, you may be familiar with those and you can check them out on the, on the internet. They're really good to watch. And, and maybe so what we've got is a red talk and so what we're focusing on is research, education, engagement, enhancement, and dissemination of the head and neck research that we're doing. So the first talk we wanted to do was around some work that we've led from Liverpool in the, um, in the arena of COVID research. And it's very timely um, because the main output of the first bit of this research is gonna be published on Monday. So you're getting a sneak preview. So the title of the talk, um, uh, the title of the paper, is head and neck cancer surgery during the COVID pandemic, an international multi-center observational cohort study. <clears throat> so back in March, uh, end of February, March, if we cast our minds back, um, the news, we were mostly glued to the news, weren't we? And it was full of these images of uh, many patients with COVID pneumonia in intensive care, that's in Italy, um, of a lot of people dying, um, of uh, big scale uh, isolation centers in Wuhan in China and big threats to our NHS. And I think those of us that were directly involved in clinical care were actually quite worried about what was gonna happen to our practices, our patients, or even ourselves uh, through the year. There was a good deal of apprehension and I've never seen social media and WhatsApp fire up so much and uh, colleagues networked and you, you would get things like this. Um, so this was sent to me um, in a head and neck uh, clinicians group WhatsApp message. Uh, a constant of the human condition seems to be the failure to learn from the mistakes of others. For your information, a mastectomy patient from last week was ventilated yesterday. All electives are potential COVIDs. People with a current diagnosis of cancer will either get radiotherapy if possible, or they'll hold on to their cancer for the next while, maybe four to six months. And if it's still treatable then, and we're all still alive, we can treat them. We'll stop diagnosing new cancers for the next three or four months, bar those that present emergently. We won't be able to run clinics without the staff and the diagnostics while this war is on. Your hospital must make itself as empty as possible in advance of this. Cancelling some cancer cases is a minor decision versus some of the real hard decisions coming down the track. Everyone on this forum will be treating acutely ill people for the next months, but not doing head and neck cancer surgery. Now, a lot of what was said in this, and I'll keep this anonymous this, as to who actually said this to me, um, didn't come to pass. But I think it was going through our own mind and there were these rumors and this thought that um, we, we, we would just be not treating head and neck cancer. It wasn't safe to do it. Um, so this problem of a surgery for head and neck cancer and whether it was safe to do it, we manage a, a collection of rapidly growing tumours. Um, for some tumours, at least, the therapy is totally reliant on primary surgery, oral cavity, salivary, thyroid and skin. Um, there's no acceptable delay therapy. It's not like prostate or breast cancer that you may be able to hold it with hormonal manipulation or other treatments. Um, it's difficult to palliate if you get out of control. And the surgery was deemed to be of high risk in terms of cross-infection because there are multiple aerosol generating procedures and are operating in the airway and in the throat and, and uh, where the virus uh, is, is present. 
And there were these early reports of deaths in healthcare workers and high rates of COVID in ENT, dental, ophthalmology professionals. So we were worried. Um, there was some opinion-based and Delphi guidance. Um, and the guidance was to avoid certain procedures and certain groups of patients not to operate on them. And uh, probably the most formal version of this guidance was this paper that was published early on and I think many of us were circulated the manuscript before it was published. And um, with a collection of senior authors, Hisham Mahana led it. And this was a series of recommendations derived from a Delphi process. Um, and it was, uh, the conclusions were uh, to avoid tracheostomy, avoid free flaps. Um, if it was constraint setting, offer palliati palliation only in elderly patients or in patients who are less fit. Um, this caused some discussion in the journal. There was a comment from um, uh, other people saying that uh, we should have data and not expert opinion, but we had no data. We all had um, a group of the three or four patients we treated last week, and we were hoping they were fine, but we had really nothing to go on. The problem with getting data is it takes a formal uh, research protocol and um, we're not bad at doing this, um, but it takes time. We, we normally go through this process where we club our mates together or get a formal um, trials group like the NCRI. Um, we generate funding proposals. Um, we have to have research contracts, regulatory approvals. We have to find a trials unit. We, did, we design our paperwork or electronic forms to fill in the data. We have to have capability capacity from R&D, green light, this can take some time. That's even before we start collecting data. And then we recruit patients, we analyze the data, we publish and disseminate. And this, this can take a long time and it moves at a really slow pace. It can be made faster with money. It can be made faster where there's a huge commercial interest or clinical interest. Um, but there didn't seem to be a way of launching a study um, that would help. So um, with one of my hats on as um, an NHR national specialty lead, I was trying to help some colleagues in Birmingham who run a global surgery unit to get their study on COVID on a portfolio. And I hadn't really given it much thought, um, but I got on the phone to uh, the chief investigator who was a colorectal surgeon called Anil Bangu. And um, Anil was telling me about it. And to cut a long story short, I uh, made false promises and I didn't even managed to get it on the portfolio and more of that later about portfolio adoption for these COVID studies. But Anil had had the similar frustrating process as we had had with his research. Um, he, he ran large international studies in surgical outcomes and a lot of them were grinding to a halt and failing to recruit because of COVID. So what he'd done, he'd had a bright idea to turn his frustrations, anxieties, use his adrenaline that this was causing and this machine that he'd got to, to divert it towards doing research on COVID, to stop doing all the research he had the NHR grant to do and in create just pivot and carry on with COVID research. And um, the similar collaborative authorship models that he developed um, using REDCap database and similar methodologies. And he decided that what he'd do is do a series of cohorts of the three, first three months of the pandemic into surgical practice and call it COVID surge. And I, I think this idea came to him and he developed it like in 24 hours. So I was uh, on the phone to Anil on the 24th of March and, and um, we discussed getting the study onto the portfolio of NHR studies. And I also asked him whether there was a head and neck uh, version. And he said, no, do you want to do one? And I thought, well, I think it needs to be done. I think we need this data. The other thing he needed was a little bit of soft funding to have some um, staff and statistical support um, outside of the NHR funding. And then by the end of the day, I'd actually managed to secure a research grant from Hassan Malik, the president of BASO. So we'd gone from a research idea to funding in, um, in around about five hours. Um, we formed a, a head and neck sort of uh, writing team or a driving a driving committee, if you like. I recruited uh, uh, four trusted colleagues, um, two maxillofacial surgeons, two ENT surgeons, and four colleagues from around the world. Um, Ian Ganley from Memorial in New York, Martin Batstone from Brisbane, Christian Simon, who head up the EORTC head and neck group, 
and a colleague in Madrid in Spain. And uh, we asked for some help from some statisticians in Liverpool uh, Clinical Trials Centre. And we uh, developed a very close working relationship with this operation group in the Birmingham COVID search team. And we were assigned James Glaceby, who was a third or fourth year registrar in colorectal surgery, who was fantastic. So very quickly after this, um, we developed our data uh, fields that we wanted. We were granted initially 10 data fields we could collect over and above the COVID search generic fields. So these were head and neck specific fields and they wanted to keep it manageable and quick to fill out. So these were ECRFs, this is page one of it, and we just collected basic information. So how do you get these permissions? There's no way you can get permissions to open something in R&D, it's not on a portfolio, there's no funding, there's no research support. How on earth would you do it? Well, the situation led to people giving permission quite quickly and easily. And it's credit to Michelle Mosser, um, who uh, heads up the R&D side on the Aintree site, um, that we got approval. It was considered as a service improvement study. Um, we managed to get it launched without formal recognition of audit, which takes time, certainly without ethics. We didn't need consent for patients because it was anonymized data. And we essentially got R&D approval. And we were recruiting on the 3rd of April, having really conceived of the idea to have a head and neck uh, COVID surge cohort on the 24th of March. So that's really is breaking all the rules. Um, further rules were broken because although it wasn't on the portfolio, the fantastic uh, trials team in the trust actually helped us enormously in collecting the data. So, so credit to Shirley on the right hand side there and, uh, and to her team and um, colleagues at Aintree managed to get this launched. And in fact, this letter, going back to this letter, was used to leverage the study open across the UK, was used to leverage it open in other European sites without ethics. And uh, it didn't work in America. In America, we needed somebody to do something like this in one of the centers and credit there to Ian Ganley, but basically pushing it through um, institutional permissions in, um, in Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, they interestingly would provide a huge long legal document about ownership of data. And we uh, rebutted it with a one page document suggested they might want to sign that one instead, which they did. Um, so the aims of the study, um, we wanted to know about the range of head and neck cancer surgery in the first three months of the pandemic. Um, we wanted to look at therapeutic migration, who, who had different treatments because of the pandemic, who had less surgery, de-escalation. But critically, the main thing was safety, safety of the patients, and the surgical teams. And what was interesting, um, maybe it's the personality of head and neck surgeons, but we wanted to know whether the surgeons were doing these operations were catching COVID. And none of the other uh, specialty groups, the colorectal, the upper GI, the breast group, the neurosurgery group, none of them had data fields about COVID in the surgical team. So the methods were, this was a international observational um, red cap study, uh, red cap the sort of generic database, which is very easy to use. It was a routine anonymized data. Um, so we picked a day, which was the first day that hospital experienced a COVID admission. Um, if it was a specialist cancer hospital and didn't admit COVID, then, then the nearest acute trust. So for Aintree, it was the 1st of March. And we recorded the details on consecutive adult patients uh, given surgery for head and neck cancer with curative intent. We excluded the usual things that weren't what we would call head and neck cancer. And then we publicized this group and disseminated it um, through the writing group, through national contacts, uh, through social media, through international groups, European groups, American groups, et cetera. The um, outcome measures of interest, the primary outcome measure um, was at 30 days, whether the patient had severe pulmonary complications of COVID. So it was a composite criteria. They had to have severe respiratory complications and a diagnosis of COVID. And that could either be a positive lab test for SARS-CoV-2 or an alternative lab test, um, a diagnostic radiological findings or clinical criteria. Remembering these are the early days of the pandemic, we didn't have necessarily enough tests for the patients. So we were pragmatic and about that as if the patient was treated as if they had COVID, we would count that. The uh, secondary outcome measures were just to understand what patients' tumours and operations were included, 30-day mortality, 
um, the surgical complications and medical complications of the treatment uh, by Clavio and Dindo. As I said, whether the surgical, any, any member of the surgical team um, became ill with COVID-19 within 30 days. We tried to measure some characteristics of the, uh, the units, whether they were hot or cold sites and uh, the magnitude of the surgery. We also had data about the background community uh, SARS-CoV-2 incidents, and we were able to classify that from relevant registries. And credit here to the COVID search team, because they did the background work putting this huge data together. So results. Um, so this is the preliminary output, which is, uh, I say, heading for publication on Monday next week. Um, there were 1,137 patients operated in 133 hospitals, 26 countries. And uh, actually, most of the hospital sites were hot, i.e. there was a mixture in the pathway of patient care between COVID and non-COVID patients. And one of the characteristics of head and neck surgery is that you have requirement for um, a lot of equipment in theatres, a lot of uh, expertise amongst anaesthetists and nursing staff and so on. And it wasn't one of those areas of cancer surgery. It was easy to take out of the acute hospitals and move to private centers. So while as minor surgery, breast surgery, other things were moved, um, head and neck surgery predominantly stayed where it was in acute hospitals that admitted COVID. Um, and centers started recruiting when their first COVID was admitted. And interestingly, the highest number of cases ascertained was in week 12 with 188 cases in one week. And obviously what was happening is that the pandemic was starting in different parts of the world through kind of February and March time. And then it tailed off and it continued to tail off. And I think that was an issue about people following the guidance not to operate, about um, lack of referrals um, because our referral pathways uh, uh, dropped off and also possibly about lack of capacity, people just not, not, not having access to operating theatres. The commonest uh, tumour site was oral cavity um, and thyroid and skin cancers were also quite common sites of surgery. Um, notably, larynx and oropharynx were small part players here, only eight and six percent. Um, there was the expected slight preponderance towards male, 60% um, over 60. A third of patients uh, were unfit in terms of ASA uh, and ECOG performance status, at least two and 11%. A third of patients were locally advanced with T3 or T4 tumours, and a third had clinically evident nodal disease. There was a 50-50 split between major and minor surgery and the normal range of uh, comorbidities we maybe expect. So interestingly, in this early period, and again, remembering that screen, uh, COVID testing um, wasn't widely available, only half the patients were screened. So if we repeated this now, um, it would be very close to 100%, I believe, um, of patients screened prior to surgery. So most of the operations involve removal of a primary tumour, no surprise there. Um, only 50% included a neck dissection. So we looked at that. So of the oral cavity tumours receiving a neck dissection, um, it was only 30% of T1, actually only 80 odd percent of T3 and T4. So there's evidence of de-escalation there of people who would normally get neck dissections not getting one. Reconstruction, I think similarly, um, a third of all the cases received reconstruction, but only half of those were free flap. And again, looking at oral cavity cases where we would understand what we'd expect, 52% had reconstruction and a third of those were free flaps. So I think there's evidence of people keeping the surgery simpler. And the airway management, again, this, this av av uh, avoidance of tracheostomy. Most patients were extubated, which carries its own risks. So the key data uh, is in patient safety. Um, and uh, there were 29 patients that were, had a lab or clinical diagnosis of COVID or SARS-CoV-2 within uh, 30 days of their operation. Our primary outcome measure was this diagnosis and severe pulmonary complications. And that actually only occurred in 13 patients, only 1% of the cohort. And of those 13, um, three of them died and the others uh, became ill. Um, but uh, recovered. Um, and so the, you might say, well, how would you know if you're not doing testing, how would you be certain you can discriminate between a normal post-operative chest infection or a pneumonia? 
and a patient with COVID. And the honest answer is maybe we can't, we have to put it to trust, but the total severe pulmonary complication rate, irrespective of COVID was uh, 4% of 40 patients. So there wasn't a huge maneuver for misdiagnosis. Um, the total, uh, some of the problems, 40 patients. The other way of looking at it, and we had this discussion about presenting the data of those 29 patients who uh, developed COVID or a positive SARS-CoV-2, um, the outcomes are actually very bad. 44% uh, developed severe pulmonary complications and 11% died. So um, it's a very serious issue if patients are either coming into hospital with COVID or getting it during their, their operative course. Um, it is to be avoided at all costs. Looking at complications outside of that, they were actually unremarkable. We had um, wound complications, which is our, probably our commonest complication in head and neck surgery in 11%, flap failure, um, free flap failure in 1%. And our overall 30 day all cause mortality was 1.2%. And I think 1.2% would, would fit with our normal data in a non COVID cohort. Um, we got 29 events, so that's not enough for a multivariate analysis, but we were able to perform a univari univariate analysis. And um, so the associations with our primary endpoint, which is basically COVID pneumonia. Um, it was weakly associated with T4 stage, uh, no positive disease and critical care admission. And inevitably with bigger numbers, we would see that those three things were likely interrelated and we don't know which one's driving it, but these people, I guess, are having the uh, bigger operations, the longer hospital stays and perhaps more interventions, more time in theatre. Um, so I think notably, there were no associations with advanced age, uh, with patient fitness and comorbidity. Uh, there were no associations with tumor site, with the use of free flaps or the use of tracheostomy. So uh, I think significant amount of data, I accept uh, a small number of events, um, but in you know, 1,137 patients, there's no evidence that this, this story, this rumor that we shouldn't be doing free flaps, tracheostomies, or what have you, or operating on elderly or comorbid patients. No evidence that that was an issue for patient safety. Um, clinician safety. And so members of the surgical team developed COVID after 40 of the operations, so about 3%. And we may say, well, so what? There's no, uh, we can't draw a causal association um, between the operation uh, because these people might be picking up COVID in society from their families. Um, they might go to ITU, they might've been redeployed, um, they might've been doing um, uh, ITU tracheostomies for COVID patients. So, so when we looked at the data, I think it was interesting because uh, this strong association. So um, where a patient developed COVID, um, a clinician in the operating team um, developed COVID in 24% of those cases. And so that, that alignment of those, uh, those two sort of in the Venn diagram I think says something about cross-infection. We didn't collect the data on the outcomes of the surgeons who developed COVID. Um, we were able to do a crude estimate. So we knew the background population rates and the incidence of COVID per month per head of population. And then we could derive an estimate of the incidence of COVID in surgeons. And it is uh, around 10 times, an order of magnitude higher than their background community. So uh, head and neck surgeons are at risk from COVID. We did a, again a univariate analysis on these 40 events and again underpowered for a multivariate analysis and I've told you the answer already at the bottom here and whether you can see this but the the strong standing out feature um, for a surgeon developed COVID is when their patient was also COVID positive with an odds ratio of 10 and a, a decent confidence interval. There were softer associations, um, less significant in uh, high community incidence areas and in oral cavity patients, tracheostomy patients, and in patients who had surgical complications. Therapeutic migration and de-escalation, and here the data is, is less certain and there's making some assumptions against historical norms. We actually put this data in discussion and not in results in the paper. So um, 
we think there's, there's evidence of therapeutic migration away from operating in larynx and oropharynx and these patients instead receiving radiotherapy-based treatments. And there's evidence that I've mentioned uh, a few slides ago about de-escalation of oral cavity cancer. Um, only two thirds of patients receiving neck dissection, only half of them having reconstruction and only a third having free flaps. Um, the distribution of cases, we've tried to draw the data from normal times about the percentage of squamous cell carcinomas that are in the oral cavity, the larynx, the oropharynx, and the percentage receiving surgery. And I think it's true to say that our observations are that uh, most oropharynx and larynx patients were diverted away from surgery to radiotherapy-based treatment, and we can't be precise about the exact numbers, but it's something going on there. So there is a uh, potential interest in seeing what the outcomes of those were. Um, so the higher rate of tumors amenable to surgery were treated with radiotherapy, particularly larynx and oropharynx. Neck management was more conservative and less complex reconstruction. Um, so what we don't know about in this study is that the chemotherapy and radiotherapy used um, was de-escalated or changed, um, but there are parallel collections of data um, particularly in the UK by CT Rad at the National Cancer Research Institute, which might prove useful to join these data sets up. So in conclusion, um, head and neck surgery was predominantly safe, even when the surgery was complex and prolonged. So that's reassuring and it allows us to reassure patients and it allows us to pressurize our health systems to allow us to operate. And we thought when we wrote this paper, that this will be for academic retrospective interest only. And look what happened in Liverpool in October. And we actually had a worse surge of the COVID pandemic and more than likely we'll get another one before the vaccine kicks in. I think uh, most of us are expecting a third wave in January, February time. So amongst patients who had an neck surgery during the first pandemic, COVID-19 was uncommon, but where it did occur, it was associated with uh, severe pneumonia and high mortality. There was an overlap between patients and surgery, surgeons with COVID that likely reflects failings in testing of cross-infection and PPE, and there's work to be done there. And there's evidence, indirect evidence, I guess, of significant therapeutic migration away from surgery and de-escalation of surgery when it was used, which might have significant um, implications for patients. So that uh, is due to be published on the 21st of uh, December. I'm pleased to say the journal Cancer are doing quite a lot of press and we're hoping to do a fair bit of social media around it because we think it's an important message. So rather than send a verbal written so forth abstract, um, we have uh, developed a graphical abstract. And what we hope to be able to do is get people rattling this along their smartphones and spread it far and wide. And what I'll get Julie to do is to send you all this graphic abstract um, on Monday and you can spam that far and wide. So I think um, I didn't do the artwork. I'm very grateful for hands down in Exeter who did. If you have head and neck surgery after 30 days, there's 1%, 1.2% mortality. Of the 3% that get COVID, 45% pulmonary complications, 11% die, and in 24% of operations there's contagion towards the staff. And I think it sort of says everything in one slide in a nice, easy, understandable way. And that's one thing COVID Surge have done. They've produced a graphic abstract for every paper, which I think is really nice. And it probably breaks the rules and undermines the press release, but it's probably more effective. Um, the other thing that breaks the rule here um, so uh, there are 846 authors of this paper. They all have equal status as a flat authorship profile. There is no name associated with the paper. The, the author of the paper is the COVID Search Collaborative. If you want to look, um, so that all of these authors are PubMed citable. If you want to look, there is a writing group, an operations committee, a stats group. So you can tell who did what, um, but the way that we gain collaboration and co-authorship is to promise people equal status. So the future work, um, so I've presented this data on just over a thousand patients. In fact, in total, we collected data for over 5,000 head and neck cancer patients from this first three months. 
And so um, we're going to repeat these analyses for the safety data and hopefully we'll have enough for a multivariate analysis. We're also really interested, even if the findings aren't particularly COVID related, um, you know, have we been treating um, HPV or pharynx with uh, primary radiotherapy without chemotherapy? Have we been doing oral cavity surgery without neck dissections? And there might be really interesting survival, recurrence and functional outcomes. So we wanted to do a two year outcome on as many of these patients as we could. And we thought about how to get this funded. And um, so we approached Barna, the British Association of Head Neck Oncologists. They've launched a thing called Grand Challenge, which went ahead in August. And it was a virtual Lands End John O'Groats uh, run or cycle. We all got involved. There's uh, some members of the writing team getting involved and raising money. And what we've done is uh, commissioned some work at Bicops, which is colleagues of Anil Van Gogh in Birmingham. Uh, there's Tom Pinkney, who uh, runs uh, an observational study group. And uh, Liverpool are going to continue to do the stats through uh, statistical colleagues at the trials unit. And so that, that money is now raised and is changing hands as we speak. And we hopefully we're going to have a new protocol to look at the two year outcome data. I'm going to mention uh, very briefly and rattle through the significant COVID surge outcomes. So this was the first outcome which got published in The Lancet. There was early data from China. It was very weak data on surgical patients who were operated whilst they had COVID. Um, so here data on 1,100 patients, and it's, it is similar to our head and neck cancer data. The um, half of the patients had pulmonary complications and uh, half of those died. And so it's extremely dangerous. This paper was fascinating how it came about. Um, again, a collaborative model. Uh, the group sent the paper to the Lancet with only a small percentage of this data and said, look, by the time you've reviewed it, the, the, the actual numbers will have changed, but the meaning will be the same. And so the Lancet accepted the paper and then the paper was populated with a new data lock um, when nobody had actually seen the data, but they accepted the statistical method would be the same. Um, the, all of the various cancer groups, so the breast cancer group have done what we've done, the, uh, the upper GI, lower GI, the urology, the thoracic group, um, they've accumulated their data and uh, there's 9,000 patients in this paper. So really this uh, justifies uh, COVID free pathways. So looking at this paper in the Journal of Clinical Oncology of the 9,000 patients having elective cancer surgery, um, the um, mortality rate um, was halved if they were in a, a COVID free pathway and the rate of pulmonary complications was halved from 5% to 2.2%. Um, and it's, I think it's credit to my head and neck colleagues that um, the head and neck data is 10% of this. So that's, that's a pretty good performance from the international head and neck community. The current study that has just finished is COVID surge week. The question came, okay, we're screening our patients now. So we've screened our patients. He's having, oh, the screen's come back positive. He's had recent COVID. How long do you need to wait as, as a uh, fallow period do you send the patient off for one week, for one month? Um, how safe is it to operate on somebody who's had COVID recently? So they launched something called COVID Surge Week in October. And the idea here was we would just record whether the patient had a positive swap for COVID, what the operation they had and what the 30 day outcome was. And people are really getting the hang of this now. So this study has recruited 137,169 patients in 1,644 hospitals. I think to our credit, we entered um, quite a few, a few dozen patients during a week in October. And we look forward to seeing that data, which is being crunched at the moment. The other question that's been arise is that uh, now we've got the vaccine, why didn't we vaccinate the patients during pre-op workup? Um, so um, there's a thought to do COVID surge vax, where again, an observational study, patients who are, and are not vaccinated looking at their outcomes. Um, that's not concrete yet. What about rebuilding our non-COVID, non-UPH public? UPH is urgent public health. So in March, uh, the chief medical officer ordered that non-COVID research would largely stop and in favor of all the COVID studies. In 2020, it looks like, so normally there are 700,000 patients recruited on the NHR portfolio in England. This year, it's a million. 650,000 COVID patients recruited and about 300, 350,000 non-COVID. 
So we've at least halved our COVID research. And so what about getting our own research, our normal head and neck cancer uh, portfolio back on track? Well, we've been building numbers. This is uh, data showing that every year in England, we've increased our cancer trial recruitment by 10,000. And this year, inevitably, um, we're gonna see this number drop off. Surgical recruitment is actually a better performance. It's doubled in the last five years um, from around 15,000 patients to around 30,000. So nobody wants to put today's line on this graph, but I do have the data here. So what we've seen, so what we've got in the kind of pinky color is 2018-19 data. In the bluey color, we've got uh, 1920 data and the black color is 2020 data. And what you can see in April is we would expect to have, sorry, I've clicked through the slide. What we'd, uh, saw, what we'd see say in April, is we'd expect 8,000 patients recruited to the cancer portfolio. And what we actually saw was 300. So the number of cancer recruits has crept up. And I think the best case scenario, the, the November data isn't true. Um, it takes time to soak in. Um, the best case scenario is we recover to around 50% month by month and probably a third of the cancer trial recruitment that we should have seen. So it is very significant and it will take some recovery. I was gonna finish there um, and you've seen the data first. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so, so Ben Nerton is asked, was there any data collection for patient pathways before major surgery? For example, how many patients are brought in following a period of self-isolation or testing? So uh, the, the data on um, screening and pathways was some of the weakest data in the cohort because you'd have to ask a very sophisticated set of questions that would take a, a whole page of the, the case record form to actually nail down. So uh, the answer to your question is no. And if you actually look at what happened in the three month cohort, even in our own unit, um, we started off with no, uh, no clue what to do. Patients were brought in without testing and just put on an operating table. And then we became quite strict and um, we insisted patients were isolated for two weeks. They were tested um, and uh, more latterly, we stopped isolating patients for two weeks because it was felt that the testing and then isolation for two days after the test was enough. So I think the problem was um, we couldn't really precisely happen, work out what happened even in one unit, let alone all the different hospitals. From, um, from Francis, do you think the percentage of advanced disease uh, T3, T4 has increased during the pandemic. Are there less T1, T2 surgeries due to patients delaying seeking treatment or are they receiving alternative treatment? So, yeah, I think, so we don't have data for that here, um, but anecdotally, um, uh, you know, uh, some of us have developed a practice for um, early oral cancer, for example, of doing laser excision, sentinel node biopsy. I think in a typical year, um, I would be doing about 15, 18 of those, and I have done one of those operations since March. And I think we're, we're still busy for major surgery. And again, anecdotally, my colleagues uh, who do laryngology have had a lot of emergency admissions with airway compromise that they would hope not to see. Um, we have seen patients present with advanced disease, um, and... Uh, Unfortunately, some patients present in a palliative state who we have had symptoms for six months and more. Yeah, that's sort of what was, what was expected in a way, wasn't it? But it's uh, not nice to see, I can imagine. I think the, the guesstimate is that for every COVID death, there will be one cancer-related excess death. That's the, that's the prediction. The cancer patients are as big a loser as any group of patients who succumb to COVID. And that's without looking at the functional consequences of people having, you know, laryngectomy and major treatment where they might have got away with minor treatment. Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, Sturgeos has asked, what's the rationale for reducing neck dissection and admittedly clean operation where we can seal the mouth? Also, will this de-escalation impact on patient survival or become a paradigm shift of treatment? Yeah, so the rationale for doing it, um, I suspect, was lack of capacity and uh, a wish to get patients off the operating table and get them out of hospital. It may be the difference between a day case procedure and a, and a couple of nights in hospital. Um, so we didn't probably have the, the texture of the data, the granularity to work out why people did what they did. Um, 
my expectation is that that will impact on net recurrence rate and survival. Um, but actually we've been um, trying to do a trial in the UK, um, you know, in, the, in this area of uh, neck management in early oral cancer. So that's why I think we want to do the follow-on study to look at the uh, oncological consequences of some of the de-escalations and migrations and changes in management. Um, so it's not a randomized trial, but there's plenty of data out there to look at. Okay, thanks. And another question you might have answered other, um, in that answer actually, but are you going to do a long-term cohort follow-up study? So yeah, so that's that's the two-year follow-up. Um, mm -hmm. I think two years long-term. Um, there aren't many of the groups that have got the energy to do it. And I think, again, it speaks to the, um, the energy and the initiative enthusiasm of the head and neck group that we've got going. Um, the, um, there's not an obvious source of funding. Um, we will have to rewrite a new protocol. We'll have to go through a few hoops. Um, and the other group that have done that are urology. Most of the other groups haven't got the, uh, the plan to follow up. And, and we know that some of the centers won't give us two year data. So it will inevitably be a subset of the, the 5,000 odd patients we've got. One thing that would be nice um, if we can uh, liaise with the NCRI radiotherapy audit, because with the centers that are recording data for COVID surge, if they've also got radiotherapy data for the CT RAD cohort, um, this sort of big data, hopefully we can merge in the middle and share data on our outcomes. Okay, thanks. And then finally from the questions are there at the moment, have you got a thought on what you feel is the optimum um, minimum self-isolation period prior to surgery, including a negative swab? Uh, no, um, I think anecdotally, uh, people uh, have used two to three days. I think there's some uh, rationale to it, but very little evidence. Um, yeah, I think, um, I actually think vaccinating patients during pre-op makes a lot of sense. I've got no evidence for that as well. And again, that could be audited. So, you know, some of these things were done with best intentions and no evidence. And that's why we're starting to chip away. So I don't think we can answer that with this data. Thanks, Richard. That, that, that's all the questions. There's quite a few nice, nice little comments there. So thanks everybody for your, for your comments. Um, just towards the end, I'm going to hopefully, if it works, click on a poll, a bit of a um, quick evaluation. I'd be really grateful if you could uh, complete that just to give us some some guidance on, on, on how this has worked and, um, and what we can do for, for next time. But certainly from, from my point of view, Richard, thank you. That was um, really interesting. It was also great to hear the startup and it being so quick as well. Yeah, so I think um, the, the adrenaline of the situation and the anxiety uh, helped us to get things going. And um, yeah, I think that's probably true of all the, all the COVID studies, if you like. Um, so for this series of, um, what are we going to call them, red lectures, <laughs> whatever we call them, um, we've got other lectures planned in January, February. If you're a researcher and you want to present, please contact Julie and um, we'll have a monthly lecture and we look forward to the topics being very different and the, uh, hopefully the attendance equally good.